This video is brought to you by CabBeast.com. Design your own custom snapbacks and hats. CabBeast.com. We are beast. On this episode of Off the Script, number 173, part number 2, for your Saturday, June 10th, 2017! I got news on Jim Cornette challenging, bro. You challenging me for $5,000, bro. No guns, no knives, bro. Can I bring my Monday Night Raw script from 1998 to the fucking battle, bro? What do you want from me, bro? What do you want from me? You're making fun of my wife. You're making fun of my religion, bro. You're making fun of my, my move to Indiana, bro. What is your problem, bro? Cornette, bro. Challenges Vince Russo to a fight for $5,000. Oh, my God. What are the rules and what the fuck did Jim Cornette say, man? We're going to talk about it right here on Off The Script. Also, Jeff Hardy opens up about returning to the WWE and keeping it a surprise. Uh, we're going to go over the uh, Ring of Honor star that WWE has great interest in. I wanted to make mention of this yesterday, but it did not make part one, so we're going to talk about it right here today on Off The Script. Kurt Angle versus Finn Balor? Much rather see that than fucking Triple H, I'll tell you that. Plans for Lana on SmackDown Live. Austin Aries on if he's happy with the way the Cruiserweights have been presented so far in WWE. Rumors on the Fashion Files. WWE holds a mandatory meeting for talent regarding cybersecurity. Jake the Snake Roberts begging for a match against Bray Wyatt. And oh my god, great balls of fire! WWE reportedly had copyright issues. It should have had copyright issues, so it would be banished from the pay-per-view calendar. You fucking retards! All this was so much more right here on Off The Script. J.D. Get off my fucking TV and save me the misery and all you fucking goons. Just grab a cold beer. The man of the hour is finally here. JD from New York, 206. It's time for off the script. JD. What is going on, guys? JD from New York here. Thank you so much for tuning back into the channel. This is, of course, episode 173, part number two of the number one fucking podcast. Not only in your subscription boxes, man, but right here on YouTube.com for everything WWE. This is Off The Script. I want to thank everybody, as always, for your continued love and support of everything that I do. If you missed part one yesterday, where we go over the return of John Cena and the incoming feud that is nothing more than inevitable between Cena himself and Jinder Mahal, it is coming. We talk about that and a variety of other things in part one. So make sure you guys go and check that out. Video will be linked in the annotation that you see right in this very video. Please keep up on the support for Rusty and his bike tour for MS, man, this coming August. I will leave his donation link down in the comment section. I'm going to leave it pinned all weekend. I want you guys to take advantage of that and show some support for his cause and his bike run 
or his bike tour this coming August for research of MS, man. So make sure you guys go and do that. I would greatly, greatly appreciate you guys keep up on that. And let's show him and everybody involved the power of this podcast, man. Let's help him out there. I would greatly appreciate that. Follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you have not done so already. Hit that subscribe button down below with the bell for that notification so you guys know when I upload. If you guys want to support the Patreon page, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Early access to Off The Script. Discord access for our group chat. And $3 or more gets you Off The Script Retro. Another two-hour podcast you guys can go listen to right now on Patreon. If you guys are not on the Patreon page and you actually want to listen to it on the IRW Network, amongst other great stuff that's on there, irwnetwork.com. Off the script, retro, available right now on the IRW Network, man. So make sure you guys go and check that out as well. Audible is offering you guys 30 days free to try their service out with one free audiobook of your choice, no matter what, man. All you got to do is go through the sign-up process, fill out the information, choose your book, and you are directly supporting this podcast, man, for absolutely doing nothing. It's a great fucking deal, man. AudibleTrial.com slash off the script. Over 180,000 books to choose from. A lot of those are wrestling-related uh, and it's compatible with iPhone and Android, man. And no matter what you guys do, if you want to cancel the service within the 30 days, you're going to get to keep your audiobook for free. Absolutely free, man. So that's audibletrial.com slash off the script. Great way to support this show. Barbershopwindow.com slash off the script for your t-shirts. We are an official partner of Barbershop Window and Pro Wrestling Tees. $19.99. They ship worldwide. They are of the finest quality. And if you guys want to look good this summer, no better way than shopping with Barbershop Window and checking out the online store for Off The Script. Loot Crate. Try LootCrate.com. We are still sponsored by Loot Crate. Anything that Loot Crate offers, you guys can get 10% off of using that link. Try LootCrate.com slash Off The Script and enter the coupon code JD from NY at checkout. 10% off. And please visit our newest sponsor, CapBeast.com, for custom-made hats. If you guys are into that type of thing, you can use the coupon code JD10 for 10% off. All great ways to support this show for doing absolutely nothing, man. Thank you guys so much for all of that. Uh, I do want to make mention, man, I was recently invited to the House of Glory school. Sat down with Amazing Red, unbelievable guy. Sat down with uh, some of the handy guys that work behind the scenes that make House of Glory look so fucking fantastic each and every time. Um, they invited me, which I am very appreciative of and gracious of. I did my first one-on-one -on -one interview with the House of Glory world champion, Anthony Gangone. And we sat down for five minutes. We went over current storylines. I asked him the hard questions. And it's all going to lead into bigger and better things for House of Glory, man. Wait till you see the cards that they got coming up for July and August. It's going to be big. And you're not going to want to miss this interview, man. Hopefully, it'll be on their YouTube channel, I think, uh, either today or tomorrow. Some point this weekend. Um, if it is, I will link you guys... The video, and I will even show the video here on Off The Script. It's going to be great. Very excited about that. I got to see some of the new students try out. I got to see some of the work that goes into the House of Glory Academy. Man, fantastic fucking facility. Uh, everybody there that I that I seen working that evening worked their asses off, man. So good stuff coming. A lot of great talent coming from House of Glory, and it's just going to be great, man. Bigger and better things to come, absolutely for sure. And I want to thank everybody for, again, making me a part of the House of Glory family, man. I can't wait to show you guys that interview with Mr. Gangone, the House of Glory world champion, the longest reigning House of Glory champion in that company's history. So look forward to that. Let's get on into the news, man. Before we do that, I got to show you Matt Hardy. You guys know you got to see Matt Hardy, man. So uh, when you know Matt Hardy's there, you know it's time for fucking news and rumors right here on Off The Script. A word from the general. And his broken brilliance right here 
on Off the Screen. Ladies and gentlemen, I have broken that heart. This is JD from New York. Actually, delete to JD from New York. I have cleaned this vessel. Make sure to check out his wondering show, Off the Script. It's absolutely delightful. Wow. We're going to start off with this story, guys. WWE reportedly has great interest in another Ring of Honor star. There have been rumors for the past few months that former Ring of Honor stars Adam Cole, Kyle O'Reilly, and Bobby Fish could be heading to the WWE. According to a new report, there is now another name that we could possibly add to the mix as future WWE signings. According to the latest Wrestling Observer Newsletter, WWE is said to have great interest in Ring of Honor star Dalton Castle. The report says that his contract expires at the end of June with Ring of Honor. The company would have to offer Castle something big if they want to match what WWE will off offer. Names like Cole, O'Reilly, Fish, and now Castle have been rumored for the past few months, but nothing has come of it yet. It appears like it might be contract related to WWE and that WWE has to wait a certain amount of days after their deals expire to legally offer them a contract. We'll have to wait and see, but as time passes, we might see some of these names show up in NXT. An exciting prospect for WWE fans as Castle is extremely talented. I don't know much of Dalton Castle. For those who watch Ring of Honor, please fill me in down in the comments below. How do you think he would fit in with NXT and the WWE? I've heard other people that I listen to uh, say that Dalton Castle should at least right now be in contention or at least Ring of Honor champion. That's how good that they say he is. I don't watch Ring of Honor. I'm not familiar with Dalton Castle, so you guys got to fill me in on that. So, you know, Adam Cole, Kyle O'Reilly, Bobby Fish, I've been hearing these names for months. So we don't know what's going on with that. It all has to do with legal bindings with Ring of Honor and WWE. If Dalton Castle is going to have his contract run out with Ring of Honor, we might not see him in WWE for a few months. I don't know how long that, that legal binding is where WWE can't talk to Ring of Honor talents after their contract expires. I don't have any information on that, but you know, it looks like WWE is looking to scoop up a lot of Ring of Honor's talent because long-term deals are very hard to come by in Ring of Honor right now. I don't know what the reason is. I don't know if Sinclair is losing interest in funding Ring of Honor. I don't know what their what their mindset is, but you, you can't really be a competitive brand in, in North America and have this type of talent go to NXT, which is the independent's direct competition. You know, WWE is looking to have their hand in everything. They're looking to bolster NXT. You don't want to let this talent go without at least giving them a fighting chance. I don't understand it. I really don't get it. Why they, they don't just sign these guys up. Maybe it's just on that on that particular wrestler's mindset. I don't know. Maybe they don't want to be there anymore. Maybe they think they're good enough for the next level and everybody has NXT on their mind. I don't know. I really don't get it, but they do have great interest in a lot. The latest being Dalton Castle. Let me know what you guys think of Dalton Castle. How do you think he would fit in NXT? Do you think Triple H and William Regal and everybody involved in NXT would bring out an even better Dalton Castle than what you guys are accustomed to seeing with Ring of Honor, man? So let me know in the comments below. Dalton Castle might be on WWE's radar for NXT. Jeff Hardy opens up about keeping his WWE return along with Matt Hardy a surprise. Jeff Hardy was recently a guest on the Talk is Jericho podcast. Jeff spoke on a wide variety of topics about his life and career. One of these topics was about his recent return to WWE. The Hardy Boys returned in spectacular fashion at WrestleMania 33. They shocked the world by entering and winning the latter match for the Raw Tag Team Championships. During the interview, Jeff opened up a bit about returning home to the WWE, and I quote, It was one of those things that was inevitable. I think when I did Jim Ross's podcast live at the House of Blues back a couple of weeks before WrestleCon, or a couple of WrestleCons ago, I'm sorry, that was the big question. So it was a few WrestleCons ago. Are you ever going to return was the question. And then I was like, oh yeah, it's inevitable. I wasn't sure how it was going to come about, but I always knew deep down, like, 
You're not going to know what that extended family means. Even back then, I remember. We want you to be a part of the extended family. So yeah, it was inevitable and meant to be in some weird way. Just how it all happened was a perfect story. From the expedition of gold to becoming the WWE Tag Team Champions. I mean, it was just the perfect story. He also expressed how difficult it was to keep the surprise a secret. We knew that after our contracts expired with that other world, basically we knew we'd been through all the deals that we had to go through. We just had to keep it a secret, and that was very hard to do. Like, the day of WrestleMania, I was lying like crazy. Will we see you tonight? No, I'm the first flight out of here. Even in interviews on the Friday and Saturday before with these people, I even said, yeah, we'll be with Ring of Honor through the summer, which we all knew was bullshit. We all knew was bullshit. We, we kind of, from a fan's perspective, we all knew that, you know, the Hardys winning the Ring of Honor Tag Team Championships from the Young Bucks in such a surprising fashion, and them having that Lakeland show in Lakeland, Florida, Super Card of Honor, you kind of knew they were going to drop the titles back to the Young Bucks then. So, even when Jeff Hardy said it, the ones with brains realized that, you know, he's probably bullshitting a lot of people, because obviously they want to keep it a surprise. But, you know, they returned, they won the Raw Tag Team Championships. Now, if only Matt would go broken and Jeff would be on his way to becoming a singles guy on Monday Night Raw. That remains to be seen. I know Rebby just had uh, her new child, Wolfgang. So congratulations to them. The new child was born at home close to midnight on Friday morning. Um, so that was great. And there's been no talk of anything broken, being that probably with the incoming birth of their new son and all that going on, they didn't want to really hamper down and stress Rebby out over this bullshit, so it's probably kept quiet right now. Or, you know, people are actually saying that quietly, WWE, the Hardys, Rebby, Anthem, Impact, they're all trying to work out a deal so that Matt could become broken sooner rather than later. That's why nothing's really been said, because, you know, Rebby's been fucking very, uh, very direct in her anger about the entire situation on Twitter. And it really lends to the to the storyline that we're seeing right now, you know, the, the, the steel cage match didn't really make any sense at Extreme Rules. It's like, we mentioned this on, on part one, Jeff's spot monkey addiction kind of took over. He was already out of the match. He escaped the steel cage without his brother Matt. He left Matt in the ring in a handicap situation, he came back into the match, jumped off the steel cage with a swanton onto both Cesaro and Sheamus. He kind of took himself out of the match altogether after that point, and it was left in the hands of Matt to drag Jeff out of the ring again after he was already out of the cage. So that could lend into the storyline here of Matt becoming upset and broken over Jeff's spot monkey addiction. I don't know. It does make sense. So, it could be, it might not mean anything, but it's going to be interesting to see because we all know at Great Balls of Fire, I'm sure there's going to be a rematch for the Tag Team Championships. The Hardys got another rematch coming up. They're probably going to execute that rematch clause at Great Balls of Fire, and we might see the continuation of this possible story. It's going to be very interesting to see, but, you know, everybody knew that they were coming. It's just a matter of time now when this nostalgia act is going to wear off and when we're actually going to get what we want, which is the broken universe of Matt Hardy. So that was Jeff on the Hardys coming back to the WWE and keeping it a surprise. Kurt Angle versus Finn Balor. Could we ever see that dream match in WWE? Kurt Angle explains why he wants to wrestle Finn Balor while he is in WWE. Kurt Angle was recently interviewed by Martin Hines of Metro.co.uk. Angle spoke on a wide variety of topics to promote his Angle Strong app. During the interview, Angle was asked who some of his dream opponents are in WWE at this current time. Angle mentions several WWE stars, including Finn Balor. Angle first told a story about meeting Balor years ago in Japan, and I quote, I've known Finn for 10 years because I was wrestling over in Japan when he was there. I remember him as this young kid with a Justin Bieber-style-like haircut, with the hair spinning all over his head. When I came back to WWE, I didn't even know he was the same person. He said hi to me a couple of months ago, and I just said hi back and walked past him. 
He was like, you don't remember me, do you? And I was like, you're the kid from Japan. He then followed it up with some praise for Balor and why he wants to face him. And I quote, what he's been able to do over the past 10 years is incredible. Not just wrestling in the junior division in Japan to the heavyweight division, but bringing this character to life, Finn Balor, the demon. He has transcended himself to being one of the most popular wrestlers in the world, and I remember him as a cruiserweight in Japan. You can't believe how blown away I am by him. I know that he was this main eventing guy doing a lot of shows in Japan before he came to the United States, and he went through the dojo camp over there. Wrestling Japanese style, which is very stiff, and he was able to survive it. On top of, uh, he was on top of the world, one of the top three guys right now, and he's just getting started. Being able to do a program with him would be awesome. I'm sure he dreamed of wrestling me back then. Now I'm dreaming of wrestling him. Listen, Angle versus Balor sounds much better to me than Triple H versus Angle. I'll tell you that right now, but listen, you know Kurt Angle is fucking foaming at the mouth to get into the ring with a lot of guys on the WWE roster, Finn Balor being one of them, man. So will we ever see that match in WWE? I don't know. Only time will tell, but it's certainly an interesting story, and you know Kurt Angle can still go, and I'm pretty sure they would give us an absolute fucking classic if they were allowed to inside a WWE ring. WWE rumors on Lana, the plans for Lana on SmackDown Live. Give me a break with the fucking kissing and the fucking Eva Marie tendencies, please. Please do not. Do not make me cringe anymore on SmackDown, okay? Please, SmackDown, I'm begging you. You took Emily. we discussed this on SmackDown Live Review. You took Emelina, and you took Eva Marie, and you molded them into the new Lana. That's all it is. That's all it is. Now, fans of SmackDown Live this week got a bit of a surprise, as not only did Lana make her debut, she was also granted a SmackDown Women's Championship opportunity. She will face Naomi at the upcoming Money in the Bank pay-per-view because... Of all women, Lana deserves a championship match by beating and wrestling nobody. What a fucking sign that is to the rest of the roster, right? You don't have to do jack shit. All you gotta do is debut and you get a title shot. There you go, man. How times have changed. Working hard gets you nothing. But debuting in a sparkly blue dress, acting like Eva Marie, gets you title shots. Must be great to be Lana in 2017. Here are some updates on Lana and the plans for her right now on SmackDown Live. According to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Lana was originally supposed to work as a heel. Due to her crowd reaction on Tuesday, the Observer notes that it is likely she will become a babyface moving forward. Lana received one of the biggest reactions on the show. It was also noted that Lana will be essentially working the role that was originally slotted for Eva Marie on SmackDown Live. There is your confirmed source right there. As noted prior, Eva Marie will not be returning to WWE. Can you imagine two Eva Maries on WWE television? My God, make that shot of bleach a triple, please. She will not be returning to the WWE, thank fucking Christ. And both sides are waiting on her contract to expire. Good riddance. I don't like the color red. Get it off my TV. The shirt worked though, by the way. Look at that. Eva Marie was featured heavily on SmackDown Live until she violated the wellness policy several months ago. It will certainly be interesting to see what happens with Lana. Her SmackDown Live in-ring debut will be a pay-per-view title match. Her only... Previous other match came at WrestleMania 32. Not a bad start to her main roster career. Now the thing is, will she be able to live up to the crowd reaction that she got on SmackDown Live? I am going to be a betting man and say no. I don't think Lana is going to have a good match with Naomi whatsoever. I think it's going to be a fucking train wreck. And I'm going to be sitting there with my cold beverage. I'm going to be sitting there with my fucking organic popcorn. Just fucking munching away. And I'm going to fucking watch this fucking fiery mess unfold right before our very eyes. If you think this match is going to be anything good without seeing Lana in the ring, if you think Lana is deserving of a championship match, if you think this is the right booking decision here, you clearly are a clueless loser. 
This is ridiculous. She shouldn't even be on the pay-per-view. At all. Give her matches against a Carmella. Or give her matches against someone that could actually work and mold her and guide her in the ring to what she should do. Like a Natalia. I'm not saying put her in the ring against fucking Charlotte. Put her in the ring against a Natty to start out, you know? I don't know how she's been doing on the house shows. If you guys have been watching the house shows, have been going to the house shows, let me know. You know, all I know is that whatever Lana was doing down in NXT with this gimmick was absolutely fucking cringeworthy to the point it was laughable. So I can imagine her in-ring skill. Are we going to be begging Lana to come back wearing the, sco- the short business skirts standing next to Rusev or are we going to embrace this new Lana? I don't know. I'm willing to give it a chance. Seriously, I'm willing to give it a chance, but it's one and done with these types of situations. If she doesn't perform, obviously she's not ready. Back to square one or revert her right back to the original role that she had that she played so well. That's just my opinion on that. But listen, I'm going to give this match a shot. I hope Lana surprises the shit out of me. I hope she does well because you can always add another female to the women's division. That's a good hand. But I don't see this coming out being a good thing whatsoever. First of all, you got it with an Eva Marie and Emelina gimmick. Failure right there. Lana is clearly better than uh, Eva Marie in all aspects. Looks and just appearance and crowd reaction. But I I don't see this ending well. That's just the way I feel. You have those gut feelings. This is one of those gut feelings. I don't think this is going to end well here for Lana. And we might be seeing uh, Lana disappear just as quickly as Eva Marie and Emelina. That'll probably be probably be the best business decision for WWE going forward. We'll see what happens. We got another week to go to Money in the Bank. We'll see what happens. I'll give it a shot. But Lana right now and Naomi, not giving it any, any, any leeway whatsoever. On part one of Off the Script this weekend, we talked about the need for 205 Live to be revamped. Because right now, it is nothing but, to me, a waste of WWE television. You know, some of you have told me after part one that I should be watching 205 Live. There's a lot of great matches on there, but I just, out of everything that you guys tell me, I just don't find any interest in 205 Live. I think the WWE, to me, the way that they have intentionally ruined the perception of the cruiserweights is just beyond repair right now. And you gotta you gotta put it in the hands of people that actually fucking care. And I mean the hands of the people who had a hand in the cruiserweight classic. That's it. You gotta move it to you gotta move it to full sail. You, you gotta you gotta put it down in the intimate crowd. You, you gotta really just put those guys in front of people that appreciate that type of thing. It, it, it's not getting over on the main roster because Monday Night Raw has ruined everything that was so special about them. And I knew that was gonna happen. We all knew it was gonna happen. So, there's a reason why we're not interested in 205 Live, and there's a reason why we're not into the Cruiserweights, and and we're not investing our time into the Cruiserweights. It's because the people on Monday Night Raw don't appreciate the talent of the Cruiserweight division. Simple as that. But, we got Neville, who's fucking doing unbelievable. We got Aries, who's great in his own right. TJP is great, you know? We got Tony Nese, who's fucking fantastic. You know, he was great in the Cruiserweight Classic. What have they done with him since? Nothing. Mustafa Ali is great. What have they done with him? Nothing. You know, Jack Gallagher, what have they done with him? Really, nothing. Akira Tozawa, nothing. Grand Metallic, where the fuck is he? You know, where are these guys? Brian Kendrick, what have they done? Nothing. Nothing. Austin Aries recently joined, busted open with Dave LaGreca and Larry Dallas. I don't listen to Busted Open, but... I figured this would be interesting to talk about. He spoke on a wide variety of topics to promote his new book, Food Fight, my plant-powered journey from the bingo halls to the big time. Food Fight, uh, is this a book that Titus O'Neil would probably get use out of? I don't know, maybe. Are there recipes in here for Titus Catering? You know, we have to find that out, man. That's very interesting. That's a new story in itself right there. One of the topics he spoke about was the Cruiserweight Division and 205 Live. He was asked if he was happy with the way the Cruiserweight division has been presented in WWE so far. Now, I didn't read this. I'm curious to know if he gives a politically correct answer, which I'm sure he did, or he really spoke his mind here. Let's see. 
Here is what Austin Aries said on 205 Live in the Cruiserweight division, and I quote, With 205 Live, I think the main thing that people have to keep in mind and understand is that there's a big vision for this. It doesn't happen overnight. It's still really in its infancy stages, and there's going to be growing pains, and there's going to be figuring out the right formula, and I think you're exposing a bunch of new people, myself included, to a larger new audience. It takes time for characters and people to get acclimated with the universe and find out where they fit in. So far, very understandable. I guess I preach patience with it in that, and in the bigger picture, we're really taking steps in that right direction. It's maybe just not maybe as quick or not exactly what other people thought it should be or how it should be presented, but what we're doing, we've got a lot of cool things going on. There's a lot of talented guys who haven't even had a chance to really be spotlighted yet, and I think they're going to start, and that's going to really hopefully shake some things up and get some fresh matchups and some more excitement into what they like to call the most exciting hour in sports entertainment. I don't think it's the most exciting hour in sports entertainment at all. I would actually I would actually rank NXT above that. And if we're talking outside the WWE realm, it's fucking far and beyond Lucha Underground. But they're not sports entertainment. They're fucking wrestling. Okay? They're like... Uh, it's like a reality show, TV show mixed with fucking, you know, majority wrestling on that show. But he did give a good answer here. But but the thing I, the thing I find problematic here is, and, you know... It's just very difficult to throw a bunch of guys that nobody knows of in front of that type of crowd, you know? The reason why it got so over is because the small crowd was easily more in tune with what these guys were doing. The intimacy with the smaller crowd, you know, got everybody on board with what these guys are doing. You're traveling into every city that SmackDown goes into, and it's preached upon. Nobody is going to stay and watch a Jack Gallagher or a Akira Tozawa or a Mustafa Ali or a Tony Nese. Nobody's going to sit and watch an extra hour of, of something, you know, when you've already seen the Ortons and the Styles and the Owens and the Nakamuras. You know, to, to a normal fan who doesn't usually attend these things every fucking week, who doesn't watch the show every week, you're asking a lot out of that individual. Especially if you have a young child who's restless and you want to get home and there's fucking work the next morning and school the next day. You know? It's like, why are you going to throw those guys out there after SmackDown? If anything, why don't you put those guys on before SmackDown? Why don't you tape it before SmackDown and just promote it as 205 Live? Like, I don't understand that. At least you get the crowd fired up, crowd's energetic, you know, crowd is a little bit more excited to see these guys. They might be on board with, with, with what they're doing a little bit more. But you're going to put them on after SmackDown, and people are just going to be like, okay, okay, here's this guy. Uh, I don't know about him, but he's uh, he does cool flips and dives, and he, he's a decent wrestler, and that's it. Nobody's, nobody's going to invest their time. Nobody's going to go out on their own and, and try and find out who uh, a Brian Kendrick is or or an Akira Tozawa, or a TJ Perkins. Nobody's going to want to do that, you know? These guys should have started off in 205 Live on NXT or in, in Full Sail. That's where they should have started out. And then you grow. You, don't, you, you just don't throw them into the fucking fire. You don't, you don't expect these guys to just go out there in front of a packed house with 11,000, 12,000 people. I mean, what kind of shit is that? Or if you wanted the cruiserweight division to be something that was fucking great in 2017, instead of giving it its own fucking show, why didn't you just promote it on the third hour of Monday Night Raw? You got three hours to fill. Why don't you focus on storylines and matches on Monday Night Raw? At least on Raw, they would be a little bit more pronounced. And you would get them over that way since it's the most watched show that WWE puts on every week. You're putting these guys on after SmackDown, and it's on the network. I mean, I'm a diehard, and I still don't even fucking watch. You know, I watch SmackDown, and I'm not going to go out and go out of my way and watch 205 Live on the network. I just don't. I just don't care. But if they're on Raw, and we watch Raw every single week, we're more apt to fucking caring about them if they're presented in the right way than if they got their own show. 
They should have been built up from the beginning, right from the Cruiserweight Classic, in the vein of the Cruiserweight Classic, with the prestige and the respect that the Cruiserweight Classic brought. Everything that that, that tournament was should have been brought over to Monday Night Raw. Everything about it. And it should have been presented with those guys in that same way. But no, WWE wanted to make the Cruiserweights out of the Cruiserweight Classic just like everything else on Monday Night Raw, which is unimportant. They didn't let them fly. They didn't let them do what they had to do. They handcuffed them and they hampered them down to, to be like everything else on the fucking roster. Why? Because if you put a TJ Perkins and a Neville in a fucking match on, on Monday Night Raw, it's going to blow away your precious Roman Reigns or they're going to outstage a Seth Rollins or they're going to... You know, they're going to, you know, be the ones that people are talking about over over a, uh, a Braun Strowman. Give me a break, dude. Give me a break. It's like WWE is sabotaging their fucking show. It's like, how are you going to build these guys by having them go out there and give you one minute, two minutes? You can't tell no story in two minutes. If I'm getting two minutes from the Cruiserweights, I'd rather not see them at all. At all. Because you're telling me you don't care, and in turn, if you don't care, I'm not going to care. No, instead of, instead, you know, of giving them 10-minute matches and storylines that actually matter on Monday Night Raw, no, they want to put them on their own 205 Live show where it's not even breaking the top 20 shows on the network. Now you know why. Because you ruined it from the beginning. Austin Aries gave the best reason that he could. I don't agree with exposing them to a bunch of new people like that. They should have started off on the network in full sale. Right out of the Cruiserweight Classic. Right to Full Sail University. Right there. And then, you know, you, you have your own show on the network there. And you promote these guys from within the division. You heavily scout Cruiserweights from all over the world. And you promote them to Monday Night Raw. And you have your own little division on Monday Night Raw. That would be a breeding ground for the Cruiserweights. Get them well known on, uh, on 205 Live on the network in front of Full Sail. You know, just like NXT, it would be the NXT for 205 Live, the Cruiserweights. I don't, I don't understand why we just had to throw them into the fire and expect them to get over on themselves. I don't, I don't get that logic. They fucked up with this to a point where I just don't care. Yeah, growing pains are going to be there, but throwing them in front of everybody right out of the gate and expecting them to get over when clearly WWE didn't give a shit about this before the concept was even brought out. The damage is done. The damage is done to the Cruiserweights. I don't care. And I'm sure a lot of you guys don't care either. Moving on from this story. This is just completely out of left field. I, I listened. I, I wanted to play the audio clip of, of Jim Cornette, but it's 10 minutes long. This is... This is a, a fucking burial of Vince Russo. But it got a little bit too personal. On Jim Cornette's behalf. Jim Cornette challenges Vince Russo to a real life fight for $5,000. Lays out rules for a fight. And a specific time, place. He's offering Russo the challenge. I don't know if Russo is going to comment on this at all. I heard Jim Cornette's side right now. I'm waiting for Vince Russo's side. But I don't know man. I don't know. Jim Cornette and Vince Russo have hated one another for a number of years. If you watched the recent Table for Three episode with Cornette, him uh, and Eric Bischoff took some jabs at Russo, who Cornette refers to as the Archbishop of Talent Burial. Russo has said in the past that Cornette could come onto his podcast, Vince Russo's The Brand, and they could settle their differences. Cornette refuses because he says Russo only wants the publicity. Instead, Cornette has an idea of his own. Which to me, you know, I mean, I don't know why Jim Cornette would just go out there and just say what he said on, on his podcast this week. It, it kind of sounds like a publicity stunt on, on Jim Cornette's behalf. I can't imagine you being this angry with somebody when you, when you physically don't even work with them anymore. He challenged Russo to a legitimate fight for $5,000 on his podcast, the Jim Cornette Experience. Cornette, in a curse-filled rant says that Russo should send him a date and an address, and he will be there. Here are the rules, says Cornette, and I quote, No cops, no guns, no knives, and we both come alone. And what happens, happens. Nobody makes a dime off of it. Nobody gets any publicity off of it. Nobody's even going to know it's going to happen until after it happens when nobody hears from you anymore. 
He continued, and I quote, So not only will I come to you, not only will I meet you in a neutral location with no cops, no guns, no knives, just the two of us, but I'm going to have $5,000 in cash with me because I got that, Vince, unlike you. You don't have to bring anything. You don't even have to bring a ham sandwich. I'm going to have $5,000 in cash with me, and you can have it if you can take it away from me. He ensures his listeners that this is a serious offer. But I'm making a legitimate offer. I swear on my mother's grave, if you give me a dime, uh, if you give me a date, a time, and an address, I will meet you there, and I will bring five grand in cash. As long as the rules are no cops, no guns, and no knives, and what happens, happens. Now, I really want to play the clip, but I don't want to because it's 10 minutes of nothing but curse words. And I know I can get bad, but this, this, is, this is ridiculous. You know, this is really ridiculous. And I don't want to have anything on my end with ad revenue, uh, you know, the way it is, you know, take a hit because of me playing Jim Cornette's, you know, expletive-filled rant here on, on Vince Russo. But he did go into detail about moving to Indiana from Colorado. He did go into detail about his wife probably not loving him. And he's surprised he's even married and how his wife puts up with it and how his wife hasn't left him yet. You know, I think he went into his kids. You know, uh, it, it was all over the place, man. It was really all over the place. If you guys listen to the Jim Cornette experience, it's like the last 10 minutes of his show before he just cuts the mic. I understand Jim Cornette's frustration here. I understand Jim Cornette. I understand that he has free reign to say whatever the hell he wants. But, you know, offering money and a fight to Russo itself sounds like a publicity stunt. And, and that's not something that Jim Cornette needs to lower himself to. You know, let Russo say what he wants to say. You don't have to come back. You know, if Russo... We all watched... You, we all watched the table for three. Nothing said there... Nothing said there was really all that bad about Vince Russo. I laughed. I laughed. Instead of being the bigger man here, Russo had to go on and on and on and complain about it on Twitter, right? Instead of taking the high road, now, I mean, I mean, you know, here I am, uh, you know, preaching something that, you know, would probably, bo would, would probably bother me too, but, you know, take this like a fucking uh, internet troll or a Twitter troll. You're going to let these fucking goons... You're going to let these fucking clowns bother you? Just block them. Just block them. You know, Vince Russo should have really took the high road here. I hope he takes the high road here, and I hope he doesn't come back with his own 10-minute rant on Jim Cornette. Bro. Cornette, bro. You know, I don't, I don't want to hear none of that. You know, the man made fun of your family. The man fucking made fun of your religion, the, the reason that you moved. He even mentioned Russo probably lives in his mother's basement. He doesn't have a dime to his fucking name. He was a failure as a booker. He buried talent. All the talent that he worked with fucking hated him. You know, he mentioned something about Bret Hart thinking that he should have been hung or some shit like that. It was, it was rough. It was fucking rough, man. I hope Russo takes the high road on, on this. And I know a lot of people don't like Russo, you know. Russo did have some good ideas. I'm not going to fucking lie. Russo did have a hand in what made the Attitude Era so great. And I'm sure a lot of the wrestlers back in the day would, would at least own up to some of that. But for Cornette to come on here and, and mention the man's family and, and his livelihood and just kind of lowball him in a way... It, it kind of it, it kind of says a lot about Jim Cornette, man. I think he I think he went a little bit too far, a little bit too far. When you when you start adding the personal shit in there, that that's when that's when things take a turn for the worse. And you know you should just cut 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 it right there. Nobody wants to have their family threatened or or made fun of or your wife or your kids threatened and made fun of your marriage. Come on, man. That's that, that that's a real low blow. I I honestly hope Vince Russo takes the high road on this one. But I did listen to it. This morning while I was making my cup of coffee, I chuckled and I raised my eyebrows a bit. It was it was an entertaining listen. I, I just don't agree with with saying that type of thing, you know, publicly where the dirt sheets and Meltzer and PW Insider and Wade Keller and fucking Satin and all these guys are going to pick up on this. And it seems more and more like a publicity stunt on Jim Cornette's behalf with the five thousand dollars, the no cops, the no guns, the no knives Nobody's going to fucking see you after I get done with you. Like, threatening to fucking just end this guy's life. You know? How can you hate someone that badly? 
after all these years. You don't even work with him. And over a table for three segment? Come on, man. You know? But if you guys want to go listen to it, go ahead. By all means, the Jim Cornette Experience. It's his latest podcast on the MLW Network. Go and listen to it. It's the last 10 minutes of his show. He just goes on and on and on and on and off on Vince Russo. Let me know what you guys think about it. If you heard it, let me know what you think down below about uh, Jim Cornette and his rant on Vince Russo. I didn't like it, but some of you might get a kick out of it, man. Moving on here, man. Rumors about the fashion files. And there's not a lot of news. You know, I I pretty much went over a lot of stuff this week. and, And there's really just, when you get down to it, there's not a lot of news. But I'm enjoying the fashion files. Over the past several weeks on SmackDown Live, fans have seen the Fashion Files segments from Tyler Breeze and Fundango. These short backstage skits are parodies of law and order. Instead of real crimes, they book offenders for fashion crimes. WWE released the sixth episode this week on SmackDown Live, and according to some rumors, WWE is very happy with the reception that these segments are receiving so far. There are apparently no plans for them to stop anytime soon. This is great news if you are a fan of the team and the segments. They have received mixed reviews so far, and a lot of fans seem to love the segments and have expressed their appreciation on social media. On the other hand, the videos on WWE's YouTube channel are not among the highest viewed of the week. Seems like a portion of the audience loves them, and the other portion just doesn't care for them. So we can expect more fashion files in the future on SmackDown Live. This is good for Tyler Breeze and Fandango, because I've always said that if you give these guys the ball to run with it, they will entertain you. They are an entertaining team. Fandango is a very, very capable wrestler in the ring. So is Tyler Breeze. That is no fucking secret. But if you let these guys go and you give them some fucking life to their character and break them away from that fucking, you know, bullshit that they were doing, these guys could shine in a comedic role, but also get it done in the ring in a serious manner. They're a good tag team. They are a very good tag team. I'd love to see, you know, a Brizongo versus New Day feud. And SmackDown is the land of opportunity. You know, the tag team division on SmackDown is looking better than it is on Monday Night Raw. That's for sure. With the Usos cutting fucking promos that are, are great. Some of the best shit that they've ever done. Probably the best shit that they have done. They've never looked better. You got the New Day. You got the Colognes. Eh. You know, they're still rough around the edges, but they're they're much better on SmackDown than they are on Monday Night Raw. You got the Fashion Police. You got, you know, the Ascension, who we haven't seen. We got American Alpha, which you guys are telling me they're... Uh, I, I think uh, Chad Gable was hurt, or they're kind of reworking American Alpha in some way. But the SmackDown division for the tag teams is not that bad. It's not that bad. And you want all hands on deck here. You got the talent. WWE should really start utilizing that talent. And I'm glad that they're utilizing fucking Brizongo. Because these guys have been wasting away for far too long, man. Clearly, they're entertaining. With the fashion files, they're showing you how entertaining they are. It's entertaining stuff. They make you laugh. And they brought the Usos to a very entertaining tag team match. Yes, most of it was comedy. But underneath that, we all know that they can wrestle. I just hope WWE doesn't go full-on comedy and lets these guys at least have some sense of seriousness. That's the fucking main thing here. You gotta gotta add and have an equal amount of both. You can't have too much comedy and not too much seriousness in wrestling because if you have more than comedy, people are not going to take them serious. I don't want to see Tyler Breeze wrestling in a fucking janitor's outfit, you know? I don't want to see him wrestling in an old old grandma's wig, you know? I don't want to see that. The guy's a great fucking wrestler. Probably could out-wrestle anybody on the WWE roster if given the opportunity. But you got to mix in that seriousness seriousness with, with the comedy. And they could be a huge breakout team for 2017. Give them the chance. We got the chance right now with the Fashion Files. But um, it can go even above and beyond that. I'm glad we're seeing it. And I'm glad that they're actually getting a run on SmackDown, man. Because going into this, we didn't think there was going to be anything of, of the Fashion Police. But WWE is proving us wrong here with the Fashion Police and the Fashion Files. WWE holds a mandatory meeting for talent regarding cybersecurity. This is according to PW Insider. There have been a number of online incidents over the past few years involving WWE stars. A recent example would be the private photos and the videos leaking about Paige Online and then with Charlotte and, you know, with uh, a bunch of others. You know, you got Xavier Woods and fucking Brad Maddox and this and that without their consent. We've also seen other incidents involving current, form, current and former WWE talent, like I mentioned. 
According to a new report from PW Insider, WWE is trying their best to help protect their stars against cyber attacks. The report says that at Raw and SmackDown Live this week, WWE held meetings with talent to try and prevent future leaks and increase their cybersecurity. The company reportedly had an expert from cybersecurity firm or a cybersecurity firm come in and do a presentation for both rosters. The expert spoke about how to avoid being tricked into their personal information being stolen or accessed. The report also states that WWE stars had to sign a new social media policy, but it's unclear what exactly this entailed. Also, there was no mention of any specific incidents involving WWE stars in the presentation. There was examples of other famous celebrities and situations that have happened in the past. This is clearly a smart move by WWE to try and help protect their talent. Hopefully, we do not see any leaks from any stars in the future. I know you guys are fucking waiting with bated breath. For a Sasha Banks or an Alexa Bliss leak that's probably going to break the fucking internet for weeks at a time. Uh, I, I understand you guys are thirsty, but remain salty. Those do not exist, at least right now. But uh, I don't see anything else happening right now. Um, don't expose your phone to anybody you don't trust. Start deleting shit that should not be on your phone. You know, again, don't trust anybody. Just don't trust anybody, you know? If you want to take a picture of yourself and admire yourself, delete it afterwards. You want to take a video of yourself and admire yourself or with somebody else, delete it afterwards. There's no reason to keep that stuff around. There really is none, you know? And things like this are going to happen. And we don't want that type of stuff to happen because, you know, Paige, when it happened to Paige, her mother came out and said that Paige was very heartbroken over everything and that she was... uh you know, on the verge of uh, having suicidal thoughts. She was worried about Paige having suicidal thoughts, that, you know, that her daughter's reputation was fucking ruined, you know? Nobody wants to see that shit. So be careful about what you upload. Be careful about what you put on Instagram and Twitter and what you have on your phone. If it's not, to, if it's not meant to be there, don't put it there. Because what if somebody gets your phone? What if you leave your phone laying around and someone picks up your phone? Or what if you give your phone to somebody else and they fucking, uh, you know, they email uh, a video that they see on your phone or a picture on their on your phone to themselves and they want to expose you, you know? People are always going to be out there to fucking get ahead and cut you down. So don't have anything on your phone that's not supposed to be there. I can't stress this enough. Delete it, you know? Delete, delete, delete. Matt, Matt, Matt Hardy's got it right. What else do we got here, man? There's really nothing else. Oh, Great Balls of Fire. Let me talk about this Great Balls of Fire having a uh, copyright infringement on it. I wish it really would have got fucking blocked because WWE naming this as a pay-per-view is really fucking downright embarrassing. They got the Jerry Lee Lewis theme song. It's like we're back in the 1950s with the fucking skater girls coming out to your car with fucking milkshakes and burgers and fries. You know, the Roman Reigns fucking diner, you know, or Samoa Joe's diner. Give me a break. WWE announced that Great Balls of Fire will be coming on July 9th to the American Airlines Center in Dallas. The name has drawn the ire of wrestling fans and has been the subject of many jokes that has been announced or since has been announced. The fucking logo for Great Balls of Fire was actually a dick with two balls. I wonder who came up with that one. Pretty sure it was Vince McMahon. Great Balls of Fire was made famous by Jerry Lee Lewis and is a widely recognizable song. Turns out that WWE had some copyright issues with the pay-per-view name. Jerry the King Lawler told the story on his podcast, Dinner with the King. Jerry Lawler shares the same attorney as Jerry Lee Lewis and says that the attorney spoke to WWE over copyright infringement after the event was announced. Jerry Lee Lewis has had the phrase trademarked since the song came out. WWE somehow worked out a deal with Jerry Lee Lewis and now are able to use the song and the name for the show. I quote, I put him in touch with WWE people and gave him a name. Apparently he called them and got everything worked out. Not only are they using the name, they are using Jerry Lee's song, which is awesome. As of this week, WWE released the first promotional video for the event and used the song. WWE should probably have done some research before they announced this event, but it's good to see that a deal got worked out. Sasha Banks actually took to Twitter and agreed with everybody tweeting her about the uh, logo, and she wholeheartedly agreed that it looked like a cock and balls. The talk over the internet for the past few days has been the logo of Great Balls of Fire 
Many fans have made jokes that the logo that the logo resembles a male penis. If you don't believe me, I'm sure you can find it on Google. Sasha Banks agrees with fans after this recent Twitter exchange. Someone by the name of Shane Warham at Hunt Rampage tweeted at Sasha Banks, Do you think the Great Balls of Fire logo looks like a dick and balls? She says simply, yes. She also retweeted a gif of Seth Rollins, which is Seth Rollins laughing maniacally in a heel-like fashion. There you go. Let me play this, man. I love it. It's 35 minutes of Seth Rollins' laugh, man. Let me, let me see this. Seth Rollins' laugh is fucking great, man. That's fucking awesome. Uh, apparently now, uh, since Sasha has spoken, the WWE looks to have changed the logo already, and it is no longer the cock and balls. It is now just the wording, great balls of fire, and the word fire is in flames. So uh, I'm sure Vince, McMahon, Vince McMahon somewhere is also laughing about fans picking up on this uh this logo and the similarities it has to cock and balls. I'm sure those are Roman Reigns balls or Kevin Dunn. Hey, you know, we should make it uh, into the size and the shape of uh, Roman Reigns. I think that would be great, Vince. Oh, Dunn, you got a, a fantastic idea, Dunn. You know? So that's that. That's that. Uh, finally here, we're going to end with this one, man. Jake the Snake Roberts. Begs Bray Wyatt, or the WWE, to give him a match against Bray Wyatt. I don't know how well this is going to go off, but uh, if my computer would like to fucking work, where I could pull up my fucking notes, there you go. Jake the Snake Roberts, who doesn't love Jake the Snake? One of the best of all time. One of the greatest villains, one of the greatest heels of all time, with one of my favorite promos of all time. When it comes to professional wrestling, fans often dream of matches that they love to see between current and old superstars of the past. After Sting finally joined WWE, many thought that they would finally give him uh, a match with The Undertaker, but that wasn't meant to be. There are many who will never have the chance to see that happen, uh, but one WWE Hall of Famer is begging Vince McMahon to let him return and have one match with Bray Wyatt. I don't see why not. Bray's got nothing else going on for him. He ain't going to be in no WWE Universal Championship title matches or the title picture. He's going to be a fucking loser... For the remainder of his stay on Monday Night Raw. That is my prediction. Bray Wyatt had a pretty good feud with Randy Orton. Yeah, up until their match at WrestleMania. Then they were never evenly matched in mind games. Wyatt needs someone who has the same mindset and who can go face-to-face -face with him in promos as well as in the ring. Jake the Snake Roberts may not be able to keep up physically, but he wants the shot. Wrestling Inc. pointed out tweets by Roberts where he actually begs WWE to give him one more match against Bray Wyatt. All he wants is one more match, but he wants it to be against the Eater of Pins. Jake Roberts hasn't wrestled since 2015, according to the Internet Wrestling Database, and that was a tag team match. Before that, he hadn't wrestled uh, a match in... Uh, or before that, he had wrestled one match in 2011, three in 2007, one in 2006, and two in 2005. In the last 17 years, Roberts has only recorded eight matches, but he still wants one more. He tweets out, Dear Wrestling Gods, please gift me a match versus Bray Wyatt. Promise to work really hard and sure it would be extremely interesting. He's reaching out to the Wrestling Gods for one more WWE match in his career. He wants to take on Bray Wyatt. While it's uncertain how this will go or how Jake could even go in the ring, he's completely accurate that a feud between these two men would be extremely interesting. There are, really aren't a lot of gimmicks and characters in WWE that are reminiscent of The Undertaker, Papa Shango, Jake the Snake Roberts. You know, and, and to be quite frank, I don't think Bray Wyatt should be compared to any of those guys, especially The Undertaker or Jake the Snake. Bray Wyatt is his own, his own gimmick, his own character. Um, you, you're not going to find another Undertaker ever. You're not going to find another Jake the Snake Roberts ever, okay? So there's no reason to compare Bray to those types of characters. If Roberts were allowed to come back to the WWE, now, 
He could very possibly create one of the greatest programs with, with Bray Wyatt. That's according to some. But there are similar characters, and it would be a great buildup. But the question remains, how good would the match be? Probably not good at all. Roberts, who was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame back in 2014, has been cleaning up his life. He has worked diligently with Diamond Dallas Page to get sober and clean while making sure that his life is a good one and not consumed with drugs or alcohol. He will probably be very committed to his promise of working very hard for the match with Bray Wyatt, but it is not known if WWE will give him a shot. It would certainly entertain Bray Wyatt with something to do as he has fallen to the wayside in WWE, and especially on Monday Night Raw, after winning the WWE Championship at the Elimination Chamber earlier this year. A feud with Jake Roberts may very well rejuvenate his career and give him extra spark that is needed right now on Monday Night Raw. Jake the Snake Roberts, on the other hand, is 62 years old. And some think that it may be far too gone for Jake to ever step back into the ring. But it's simply something that he's not going to give up on. Vader is still wrestling, though he uh, just recently retired. Uh, he was still wrestling at 62, and that is despite a number of health issues. Many others have continued to wrestle into their 60s and even into their 70s, but would Vince McMahon bring him back? There is very little doubt that a return of Roberts would make huge headlines, and a feud with Bray Wyatt would make dreams come true for not only Jake, but for many fans of the WWE. So, I don't think this is going to happen, man. I just wanted to report this because I've been monitoring Jake's tweets. You know, I, I think Jake right now, uh, just just physically, just physically, the way he the way he he looks, and you know the way he he sounds. I don't think the feud would come off as well as we think it would. Or clearly as well as it would if this was fucking back in 1990, you know. But, you know, it, it's something interesting to talk about. This is always going to be something that the fans are going to talk about. If there's one match, you know, a dream match that you could have with Bray Wyatt. You, you go back to the 1991 Jake the Snake. Yeah. That's a fucking match I would love. You take Bray Wyatt now and you put him in the ring with 1991 Jake the Snake. A fucking dream match. And I'm sure that that is at the top of a lot of people's lists. But in, in 2017, with a 62-year-old Jake who could probably barely even walk, you know, who doesn't really speak all that well right now, who's not all that coherent, it, it's going to remain a dream match. I don't think Vince would even entertain this idea. It's something fun to talk about. It's something fun to dream match. The only way you're going to see this match is in WWE 2K18. Simple as that. But it's fun to talk about, and I wanted to end this episode of Off the Script with something that Jake had said here about the dream match that he wants and is begging Vince McMahon for with Bray Wyatt. Would it be good for Bray Wyatt? It would probably, it would probably be better than anything Bray Wyatt's got going on for him right now. But will it be entertaining? Eh. That's that, that's up to that's up to fucking certain individuals, man. To me, I'm not interested in seeing interested in seeing in the 2017 with a 62 year old Jake the Snake. Not me, man. I'm not interested in it. Keep it in the video games. Keep it in your mind. Keep it as a dream match. That is everything, guys. Thank you so much for off the script. There really is nothing else, man. There's no fucking news. Got all this fucking. I got all these shows and no fucking news, man. Money in the bank coming up. No news. You know, we got uh, Monday Night Raw being fucking shit every week. No news. So I don't know what's going on, man. I'll find something. If there's no part three, you know why. You know, this summer is usually the slowest fucking time. We usually start picking up business again uh, as we get closer to SummerSlam. But right now, there's nothing going on, man. So if there's no part three, you guys know why. If there is, I scrounged up some news. So uh, don't hold your breath. But if you see something, you'll see it tomorrow morning on Off The Script, guys. Thank you so much. I am JD. Hit that thumbs up. Follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206. Hit that subscribe button with the bell for that notification. CapBeast.com. Coupon code JD10 for 10% off. If you guys want custom hats, if you guys want to check out the Patreon page, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Off the script retro is now a $3 bonus for all Patreons, $3 or above. Or if you want, and you don't, and you don't want the Patreon, you can access it through IRW Network for subscribing for $2.99 a month, man. So thank you so much, everybody that subscribed over on the IRW Network. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. AudibleTrial.com slash Off The Script for your 30 days free of Audible. And BarbershopWindow.com slash Off The Script for your merchandise, man. Hit that thumbs up. Let me know what you think of all these top stories on part two. 
I wish it was a little bit more entertaining. I wish it was a little bit more juicy with the gossip and the rumors, but there's really nothing else right now. But I hope you guys enjoyed it. Nonetheless, I am JD. Have a great Saturday, and maybe I'll see you guys on Sunday for part three of Off The Script. Until then, I'm JD. Have a great Saturday, and I'll talk to you guys soon.